here have been keeping bees for fewer than five years. Okay, so this will be especially for you. Um, when I started beekeeping, there was no internet. You got a little short book, a beginner's book, and the information was very clear. There was no varroa mites at that time, and beekeeping was pretty much like following the recipe on the back, back of a box of brownies or something like that to cook, okay? Very, very easy. Nowadays, if you go to the internet and you just Google beekeeping, you'll come up with 32,500,000 pages to read. After the first one and a quarter million or so, you're going to be so confused, you're not going to know what, what to do at all. So I suggest being careful about the, the internet. What we have is it follows the Dunning-Kruger curve. From, uh, they published this twice, actually. How difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence lead to inflated self-assessments, OK? So the beekeeper, beginning beekeeper, gets gets a beehive, puts it together, puts in a package of bees, and they take off, and they build up and make a bunch of honey, and immediately that bee beekeeper says, oh my god, all those people complaining about beekeeping, this is the easiest thing in the world. I must be a genius. Everybody else is stupid. And they start their blog. <laughs> <laughs> this is at the peak of inflated self-assessment. And then a year later, when Varroa catches up and destroys all their colonies, they hit the trough of disillusionment. Now, they may or may not take their blog down. And then if they decide to continue, they get on the slope of experience and enlightenment. Now, some of them just get another package of bees and then do the same thing. And then the next year, do the same thing. We call them serial killers. So what they do is they <laughs> buy live bees every year, and then they proceed to let them die an ugly death and come back. We don't sell bees to them. We ask people, are you going, what are you going to do for varroa management? If they say, oh, I'm going to be treatment free, we say, well, no, you should go buy bees from somebody else because we love this queen bee that we just produced in this nucleus colony. We're not going to send it off to an intentional ugly death. Now, this slope of experience of enlightenment, I got it down three to maybe 10 years before you start to get it in any other, any other art or craft. It's at least 15 years of, of continual work to, be, to achieve any kind of mastery. Now, some beekeepers are first-year beekeepers for 20 years in a row. They never learn a damn thing. Others do learn things. But what I really like about this is this, there's never an asymptote. It never levels off. You are never going to learn everything there is about beekeeping. And if you really study it hard and look at the science, you're going to die with more questions than you started with. Okay, and that's. It's frustrating, but it's also very exciting. So let me, rather than from an anthropomorphic point of view, let me go through the rules of beekeeping from the perspective of the honeybee. Rule number one, they need a warm, dry cavity, okay, protect it from the weather. <clears throat> as far as husbandry from you, that means you've got to provide some kind of box, and the bees don't care what it's made out of, how it's painted, or the shape of it. So if it's a, if it's a Langstroth, a, a Dayton, a, a Wari hive, a top bar hive, a polystyrene hive, a wooden hive, it doesn't make much difference to the bees, as long as it keeps the rain and wind off of them, and they have an entrance, and not too much wind inside. Rule number two, bees need food. Their two natural foods are nectar and pollen. Nectar for the carbohydrate source, pollen for the protein, the lipids, the um, vitamins and, and uh, minerals. Um, from a husbandry standpoint, you, put, you, take your, you keep bees somewhere where there's flowers blooming all year long. Okay? If that's not the case, you can let them go dormant when there's no flowers blooming, or you can move them to somewhere else, just like a sheep herder moves their flock of sheep. That's called migratory beekeeping. So you may move your colonies three times a year to where the flowers are blooming. It's unnatural, but, uh, but the bees can then work all, all year. Um, or you can leave your, your colonies where they are and, like I said, let them go into dormancy and then come back in. Or if you're, for example, an almond pollinator and you need to have strong colonies in February, then you can, do, you can mimic a natural nectar and pollen flow by doing supplemental feeding. I'm not recommending anybody who's a hobbyist do unnecessary supplemental feeding because there's no return on investment for you. You may just be, when you supplementally feed protein, you're just rearing more varroa mites <clears throat> so, um, and increasing a colony when maybe you don't want that population to increase. So it's up to your management goal whether you would do supplemental feeding or not. Rule number three, 
Every species have parasites. Half the species of life on Earth are parasitic. You guys all have parasites. All you have parasitic mites living in your hair follicles. You have parasitic fungi living on your scalp. You have parasites living in, inside you, okay? You all are most looking around. I can see you're all managing your follicle mites because none of you have scabies. Okay, so you're doing a good job, okay? When you introduce a novel parasite to a host species, they have problems until they evolve adaptation to it. Well, the honeybees are in that process of adaptation right now. So in some areas, there are colonies, bloodlines of bees that have adapted to the varroa mite and can survive without help. Unless you're running a, a bloodline of bees that is naturally resistant now to varroa, then as your ethical responsibility to your livestock is to control that parasite and not allow your you're calling it to die an ugly death due to varroa and the associated viruses. Okay, let's review all the rules again. They need a warm, dry cavity. They need to have food, control parasites. That's it. Anything else somebody tells you to do is a reflection of that own person's ideology or belief system or whatever they, they think up. And I, my suggestion to you is that the louder and stronger or more emotional somebody is about something that you should do, the more I just turn down the volume. Anybody who really knows beekeeping has no strong opinions whatsoever. Okay, so my suggestions are one, it's basic animal husbandry. If you have a, any kind of background in livestock uh, management, honeybees are on other livestock, they need the same exact things as any other livestock. So practice basic animal husbandry. Number two, copy consistently successful local beekeepers. Now, by successful, I don't mean the one who makes the interviews with the newspaper, not necessarily the president of your club, not the one who's necessarily on YouTube. Successful beekeepers, number one problem is too many healthy live colonies in the springtime, they're all gonna swarm, okay? No successful beekeeper ever buys a bee, ever buys a bee. So if your mentor has, is buying colonies, I'd look for another mentor. Okay, successful beekeepers don't complain because they have an abundance of bees. We have to sell, sell a thousand nukes every spring just to get rid of our excess bees, okay? And we do that every single year. And I love this. In fact, I just bought a, 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 a century-old copy of, of this book, and I have another quote coming up from it. The bees have their definite plan for life, perfected through countless ages, and nothing you can do will ever turn them from it. You can delay their work, as many beekeepers do, or you can even thwart it altogether, which some beekeepers do, but no one has ever succeeded in changing a single principle of bee life. Now here's the best part. And so the best bee master always is always the one who most exactly obeys the orders from the hive. And that's what we are. We are servants to our bees. We serve our livestock. And if we serve them well and make life good for them, they reward us with plenty of bees to sell and, and bees to rent out and, um, and abundant honey, okay? So we serve our bees. And what we do is instead of looking in a book or asking somebody what to do, we ask the bees what they need. And, and we do that by reading the combs. Now, first thing to do is understand the business model of the honeybee. That is called the ecological niche in nature. Humans call it a business model. The honeybee colony business model has two objectives. One which is concurrent with that of the beekeeper and one is at odds with it. So the one object, main objective is the honeybee colony has to put away enough honey to make it through dearth periods. Whether the dearth is in the summer or the winter, they need to store that honey. That is concurrent with our objective. We want our bees to store a lot of honey. Once they have killed the cab filled the cavity, there's only one reason for them to exist, and that is to reproduce and spread their genetics out into the environment. That is called swarming and the production of drones. That is opposite our goal. We really don't want our colonies to uh, swarm. So understand, first understand the, the colony's two goals. So work with them for production of honey, and then there are, I have a whole PowerPoint on how to work against them, work favorably uh, to avoid avoid swarming. And you can manipulate a colony to avoid uh, swarming. Now, I've done three seasons here with the colony population on the uh, y-axis and three seasons uh, with the nectar and pollen flow of what we have in my foothills. Now notice there's no dates because as I've mentioned before, winter for you guys starts here in November 
Winter in Southern California, Mexico starts in July and ends in November. So it has nothing to do with day late or dates. dates. It has to calmly build up and decline have to do with the abundance of availability of food. Now, as a youth social insect, the honeybee colony goes through four phases a year. First phase is build-up phase. So when the first flowers start blooming, they start building up their population. They have the advantage over other pollinators that first thing in spring, all other pollinators start with a single reproductive. And that single reproductive has to rear offspring. So they're foraging individually. The honeybee colony has a standing army of foragers coming out of the winter, and they can compete very successfully against all other pollinators. That's their business model, okay, to have that, that larger standing army in springtime. And they build that army up very, very quickly. Once they're about two-thirds of their way to maximum strength, they shift into reproduction mode. That is swarming. So they make drones and they send out swarms, one or more swarms. <clears throat> then they hope to recover their population in time for the peak of the main honey flow, at which time they go into the food storage phase. Once the honey flow is over, now they are in dearth and they go into the dearth survival phase. Whether that dearth happens in summer or that dearth happens during the cold of winter, it's a dearth period. So in my climate, they go into two dearths a year, okay? And they build this, so they actually, actually have two little humps. They have a second build-up hump in the fall, uh, just before, when we, if, we, if we get early rain. Then the cluster moves up and down like a yo-yo in the cavity. When there's uh, excess honey being stored, it pushes the brood nest down. And when there's a dearth, then they eat their way up. And if they happen to hit the top of the cavity before new food comes in, they starve to death, okay? We try to avoid that happening. The queen, everybody goes, wow, the queen bee, so special. I hate to disillusion you, but the queen is the only normal reproductive female in the colony, a normal hymenopteran female that lays eggs, okay? The special bees in the colony are all the non-reproductive females, all the sisters of their mother who raise their other sisters for their mother. They do all the work in the colony. The queen is the pheromonal heart and soul of the colony, but she doesn't give any orders or tell anybody what to do. The bees that run the show are the nurse bees. The bees from oh, about four or five days to 12 or 15 days old, depending on the season, because they completely control the food supply and they decide whether the eggs that the queen lays get cannibalized and have their protein recycled or whether they get fed and then raised into either a a worker bee or a, or a queen bee, and they decide how they do that by the, by the feeding. So by controlling the feed supply, the nurse bees control what happens in the colony. They not only feed the, the larvae, they also feed the queen, they feed the drones, and they feed the incoming foragers who no longer can digest pollen themselves. So they, they, they hold the key with the currency of nutrition in the, in the colony being the jelly that they produce. So the only bees that are able to digest pollen are the nurse bees. Once they transition to mid-age bees, they stop producing the enzymes, the proteolytic enzymes, to digest the pollen, and they start making an amylases to break down the sugars instead. So if you do a squash of bees for nozema, put them in some water and crush them, if you take nurse bees, the water will turn milky uh, colored from the pollen. If you take a sample of bees from the entrance of foragers, that water will stay clear because foragers do not have any pollen in their gut. Same with the queen bee, no pollen in her gut. And this jelly transfer, this trophallaxis, shares the um, this, this status of, of nutrition with every bee in the hive. Every bee in the hive always knows the status of nutrition of that colony by how willing the nurses are and how much they will share jelly with them. So if a forager comes back from foraging and it goes, wow, I'm getting a little low on protein, and goes over to a nurse bee and says, hey, uh, miss, I'd, I'd like to have a little bit of protein. She goes, oh, sorry, dude, man, we're a little bit low on nutrition. That forager knows, oh, let's not forage for nectar, we better forage for pollen, okay? So there's feedback throughout the colony. Okay, so now there are dynamics of the hive population. You have, just like in any war, you have attrition and recruitment. Once recruitment drops off, you're gonna lose, lose the war. So you have to minimize attrition and maximize recruitment. So attrition is eight to 12 days of flying and a bee typically dies, okay, that's attrition. They also can die from disease, they can die from the wind or from uh, predators or anything like that. 
Recruitment is the rearing of newbies. So the main strategy of just like any army where you're always trying to recruit new members, they just rear new members. So they just try to reproduce their way out of problems. So anytime a colony gets hit by a pesticide, by a cold, by anything else, they respond by recruiting new to get their uh, members to increase their population. And when I plot this out on the colony population on the x-axis, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 bees, typically a colony, well, in, in, our, in North America with the Italians, you're talking about 40 to 50,000. The colonies I'm seeing around here would not be uh, that, that many. But during the build-up phase, I've calculated the net daily gain or loss of bees in a colony. So during this linear buildup, you're averaging about five to 600 additional bees per day, okay? So that's your net growth. Now, if the queen's laying 1,500 eggs a day and you're getting a net gain of 500, how many bees are dying of natural mortality every day? A thousand bees are dying every day. So if you're concerned about, oh, I can't sacrifice 300 bees to do a mite wash to save my colony, you're not grasping the population dynamics in the colony. Any bee in a colony would gladly give us life if it could save the colony from ugly death from Varroa. So don't hesitate, if you need to, to sacrifice a few bees to do a mite wash assessment of the Varroa load. Now, when recruitment comes into equilibrium with attrition, the colony stops growing. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then it goes, starts, the queen cuts back on egg laying and then Attrition exceeds recruitment, and the colony then declines in population. This is a graph uh, I, I, from a study from Dr. Uh, Lloyd Harris uh, in Manitoba, Canada, back in 1975 and 76. And I've colorized. He marked, paint marked every 12 days 100 bees from each colony, and then went and every day counted how many frames of sealed brood, cells of sealed brood there were. So it's 12-day age cohorts because there's 12 days that brood is capped. So the red is, is workers that are 0 to 12 days old as adults, 13 to 24, 25 to 36. Very few live, live past 48 uh, days during the spring or summer. So you have a, a population of very young bees in the spring and summer. And then during come winter time, they go into these longer lived worker bees, and they can live up to 300 uh, days then. The other line on here, this is the amount of immatures. So the total amount of mature adult bees would be the top of the colored curve. The total amount of immatures, egg larvae and pupae, are this. Notice that you have way more immatures than matures uh, early in the spring. We'll return, run, return to that. So this proportion of adult bees to immatures is very important when you talk about swarm control. Then what I've did when I started studying this is that a colony goes through about, I think it's 13 different phases throughout the year, different biological phases. And I've written about this on my website. You can read at length the series of understanding colony buildup and decline. What I suggest is for every group, for your own locality, to create a phenological table like this for the benefit of your newbie members. And not by dates, but by, by the, whatever is blooming that time. Where I live, which is on the side of the mountains. If you drive 20 minutes here, and have a yard 20 minutes downhill from us and 20 minutes uphill, you're a full month off on phenology due to elevation. So giving a dates on a table would be nonsense in my area. Put in your typical colony population, when you typically swarm, when the main honey flow starts, put in the normal dates for that, put in when you have toxic pollens coming in, put in when you have a dearth coming in, and then overlay suggested managements at that time. What you need to do, look at for disease, for nutrition, for varroa. And this would help the beginners a whole lot put, come up with their management program for that. <clears throat> now, the key point here, Mike uh, was speaking recently. He talked about being proactive rather than reactive. And I completely agree with that, which means you look at your, your objectives at any time. You count backwards the number of days before that objective, and then you work from that backwards count. So if you know your, you always look at what your goal is, count backwards from how long it takes the colony to reach that goal, and that's when you start working towards that goal. <clears throat> so a reactive beekeeper is always having problems. You go, oh my God, my colony is starving, my colony needs more room, my colony needs varroa control, and they react to that. The proactive beekeeper sees that coming a month or more ahead of time and does action then and never has those problems. 
Okay, so my suggestions are to base all your management decisions upon the biological needs of the colony rather than what somebody says that you should do or they think is going to happen at a certain time. The other thing from my beginner's class, when we go out to our first hive, we get ready to open the hive, I said, well, first, we need an action plan. Before you ever crack a lid, have an action plan. Class, what is it? Why are we opening this hive right now? If we do open it, what are we looking for? If we find it, what are we going to do about it? If we don't find it, what are we going to do about it? And what is the plan? I don't want you to even bother those bees until you have your full plan laid out. You don't go into it, disturb your colony blindly, go in on a fishing expedition for something. Only bother your hive if you know exactly why you're opening it, why you're bothering, why you're stressing them, and what you're going to do if you find it. And I suggest learning how to read the cones, which is what the rest of this will be about. So first, recognize uh, honey. So if honey is fresh, it has an airspace under the capping, so it looks white. If it's older, that airspace is dissipated, and the capping touches the honey, and it looks dark. So you can tell old honey from uh, fresh honey. Um, fresh pollen is uh, um, non-reflective, uh, uh, placed around the brood here. And older uh, fermented pollen uh, looks shiny on the surface. That's called bee bread. It's lactic acid fermented. It's just like sauerkraut. Then you have your open brood, which are the eggs and larvae being fed. And then you have your varroa food. Some people call it a seal of brood. It depends on your perspective. If you're a mite, that's called varroa food. Okay. <clears throat> Anytime you have varroa food in the colony, Varroa is, you are a varroa keeper as well as a beekeeper, and your varroa population is increasing, okay? Some of you will be much more successful at being varroa keepers than being beekeepers, okay? <laughs> now, the nurse bees call all the shots, but the nurse bees don't fly outside, except maybe to defecate a little bit. So how the heck do they know what's happening? Again, forget being human. What we do is we look around to see what's happening. The view for the nurse bees is this. They live in a completely pitch black box. So forget human perspective. Try to, you will understand the bees when you can experience the world as though you were a honeybee. And realize that honeybees live most of their life in total darkness and then fly for eight to 12 days and die. Okay? They are a total darkness adapted insect. Okay? So the nurses have to have what cues would the nurses uh, look at to tell what's happening outside. What they look at is the amount of incoming nectar from the nectar foragers, incoming pollen from the pollen foragers, and the larval pheromone, which tells you, number one, the queen's laying, and number two, the colony is in build-up mode. So the e beta osamine, the larval pheromone, very important. They also sniff for queen pheromone uh, and, uh, um, and the number of emerging workers. The number of emerging workers which push the nurse bees off the combs greatly informs the colony. Now, if you look at the, the perfect picture of a comb in the book, where you have the band of honey around the outside, the band of bee bread here, and the brood here, people think, oh, well, the forage, pollen foragers must want to store the bee bread or the pollen right here. That's totally wrong. A pollen forager preferentially stores pollen right in the middle of the brood nest. Right as soon as a worker emerges, this is where a pollen forager preferentially stores pollen. If they can't find a place, they will reluctantly walk further and further away from the center of the brood nest until they find an empty cell and they will store it there. The nurse bees don't pay any attention to that pollen out there, and that's why it gets fermented into bee bread for storage. It is completely non-stimulatory to the nurse bees. Their cue that the colony is in billet mode is fresh pollen being placed right there. They, nurse bees way prefer fresh pollen to be bread, probably the same way you would prefer a fresh salad to three-year-old sauerkraut, okay? Same type of thing. Again, stored right next to the larvae. That is stimulatory. Now what I do is I pay attention to this interface right between the honey, in this case fresh honey, and the brood. This is the dynamic interface within a beehive. What you have is honey energy stores, which is capped honey. You have a protein reserve, for the bees, not stimulatory to the nurses, but reserve a protein for anybody in the colony. In case pollen stops coming in, they will use this up. And then you have your energy and protein demand, which is mainly the brood, but sometimes the foragers are large. There's more demand for protein from the incoming foragers than there is from the brood.
you have two interfaces. The energy interface is a single line of cells, the interface between the bee bread and the honey. That single line of cells will either have open honey, which means that the bees are eating up into the honey, or they'll have fresh nectar, which means that there's excess coming in and they're pushing the brood nest down. The protein interface is the edge between the brood and the band of bee bread. So if there's no band of bee bread here, that means the colony's living hand to mouth. If there's a wide band of bee bread, that means they have a surplus of pollen coming in. They can actually plug out the whole broodless, brood nest with pollen. So these two interfaces are what you as a beekeeper look at that tell you what's happening inside the hive. So we'll go through the seasons here. First cue in the springtime is the first tree pollen is coming in. You can see in Manitoba, it happened right here, and immediately the, the, these old, old workers immediately start wearing brood right there. This is my, one of my colonies, California, in January, when the alder trees start blooming, so there's fresh alder pollen coming in, and they initiate their first round of brood right there. That's the start of the season. That fresh pollen stimulates the nurses to produce jelly and feed the queen protein so she can lay eggs, so ramp up the queen's egg laying, and then enough protein also that they will actually feed those larvae rather than cannibalizing them. Understand that nurses are continually grooming the brood. They, they have the choice every time, do I cannibalize this egg or do I feed this egg, okay? So now the larvae put out, the young, very young larvae, not the older larvae, put out a chemo, uh, pheromone called A-beta-osamine, which is young larval pheromone. That is, tells the colony a number of things. One, we have a queen that is alive and laying eggs, okay? Number two, we are in build-up mode in this colony. That tells the foragers, wow, we're in protein <laughs> need mode, so they will forage for pollen preferentially because they're smelling that E-beta-osamine. And now we build up a little bit till we come to the spring turnover. Now notice right here, these bees here, when they start brood rearing, they shift from the survivor diutinous physiology, the long-lived physiology, and they start nurse, nursing physiology. They can be a nurse for months if, if nothing uh, stops them from being a nurse. But what does stop them, 21 days after they start rearing brood, the first new round of workers for that year emerge and they say, thanks ladies, we'll take over from here, and they push them off the brood combs. Those are now called mid-age bees. That's the reserve force before they become uh, foragers. And they do all the other tasks in the hive. They do the comb building and the honey processing and the guarding and the cleanup. Um, that's the mid-age bees. So 21 days after they initiate brood rearing, these old bees, they then can get pushed off the brood nest, and pretty soon after that, they start foraging. And 8 to 12 days after they start foraging, they die. So typically about 35 days, and that whole winter population was to survive without any attrition to speak of, disappears. The key thing at the spring turnover is they need to rear enough replacements to replace them. This is where uh, rainfall or snowfall at the spring turnover, that's the most critical time of the year. And this happens, we see this in the almond pollination. You bring in strong colonies, but if that strong colony is still the winter bees and they don't have a bunch of sealed brood in there, and then suddenly all those bees go, wow, we better start foraging. They wear themselves out before that brood emerges. Those colonies will crash in population despite abundant food being around. So here's some geriatric workers in January rearing their replacements. And then you have some of the parasites come in or, or the pathogens. And, uh, to me, a parasite, viruses are parasites. Uh, bacteria are parasites, fungi are parasites, they're all parasites, okay? Then you have the ex ex external parasites, like, like the mites. But the pathogens are seasonal. They're always in the hive. Every single hive, just like in here, if you take a breath in right now, you've, you've inhaled enough virus particles in one breath to kill you easily if they replicate in your body. Every disease imaginable is in this room probably right now, but you're not getting sick because we have our immune systems ramped up for it. So there's different seasons, so you're more apt to catch flu during the winter, okay? You're more apt to get mosquito bites during the summer, okay? The same thing with, with bees, there's a seasonality. So in the springtime, nosema and European fowl brood are the main problems. I don't have American on here. That, 
often shows up during the summer. And then late summer, de varroa and deforming virus. And then the parasitic viruses, paralytic viruses, uh, during the winter can be uh, lethal to the colony. So understand what season of the year you're going to be looking uh, for different uh, pathogens causing these diseases. Having a pathogen in your body, you guys are awash in pathogens in your bodies. But that doesn't mean you're diseased. A disease is when your immune system does not keep the pathogens under control. Okay? So, Nozema proliferates in the midgut of the honeybee when they are digesting pollen. So when there's no pollen coming in, Nozema pretty much disappears. When there's a lot of pollen coming in, Nozema proliferates in the tissues of the midgut. So here's a 400x uh, magnification photo I took. This is a spiracle, uh, uh, our trachea, of breathing tubes. And all these little white ovals, every one is those in a Nozema spore. They just fill the gut tissue. So you look at this. This is photo I took in February. We still have cold nights. We do have a little bit of a nectar and pollen flow on. Okay, again, we have cold nights. If you look at this, an experienced beekeeper say, oh, this colony is on the edge of collapse. Look at that beautiful brood right there. How do I know it's on the edge of collapse? Because we had cold nights. That number of workers could never have kept that amount of brood warm. That means there's fewer workers now than when that brood was being raised. We had attrition is exceeding recruitment. This is what we saw during the Nozema Surani invasion in the United States. We saw a lot of this in and then you'd have one more cold night, and the colony looks like that. You can see the ring of bee bread out here, how big that brood was. So you know that was solid brood a couple of nights ago. But the workers are dying at a higher rate than they're being raised. It contracts on that cold night. The brood gets chilled. The next day they come out, they remove all that brood, and you see colonies that look like this. This is what the classic CCD symptom that we saw in the US during the invasion of Nosema Serrani. And if I go in here, and if I took these bees and crushed them one at a time, typically eight out of ten, eight out of ten to ten out of ten would be badly infected with Nosema serrani. Okay. Nowadays we don't see that. We, nobody's seen this symptom anymore. That was the invasive wave of Nosema. The only bees that survived were ones that had some resistance to Nosema serrani. So Mother Nature eliminated all the susceptible stock bloodlines that were not resistant to Nosema. The other thing that confuses people is the book saying, oh, this dysentery is a sign of Nozema. There's no evidence whatsoever that either Nozema apis or Nozema uh, serrani has ever caused dysentery, and very strong observations that no, it does not cause it. But if the bees do have dysentery, which means they have diarrhea, they have too much water in their guts or gut irritation, it can spread Nozema within the colony. But if you see this, that does not mean you have a Nozema problem. You can only diagnose it through microscopy. So here's a pollen spore, pollen spore, bee seta hair, and uh, nosema uh, uh, spores right there. That would be nosema serrani. They have a little bit longer spore than the nosema apis does. So I call nosema an enigma. It doesn't normally have much effect on a well-nourished colony with a young queen. They can just deal with it. It's a seasonal pathogen that comes in the spring or, or a fall pollen flow. But if it gets too large proportion of, be of workers in the colony become infected, then it can hamper buildup or uh, honey uh, production. So now the colony, after the spring turnover, enters the uh, linear growth phase. And they can grow very rapidly if pollen's coming in. This is data from Nolan 1932 showing it's a straight line linear growth until they come in equilibrium with birth rate versus death rate. And that, comes in, that happens at about 40 times. You could say the queen's egg laying rate, but it's really the rate that the nurses are allowing recruitment. So if they are recruiting 1,000 new workers every day, feeding 1,000 uh, young larvae, then you're going to uh, reach equilibrium at a population of about 40,000 bees. If instead you have a very prolific queen and enough food for the workers to rear 1,500 new eggs a, a, a day, then you're going to pop out with a population of about 60,000 bees. So that equilibrium is reached depending, depending upon how many new recruitments, recruits there are a day. And the, you see the, you grow in a linear uh, manner right here. Now, while they're doing that, they may be living hand to mouth. They're not hungry, but they don't have a reserve. So here's colonies that we had in the springtime. 
Lush green here. We had just put the second box on these busting strong colonies in anticipation of the uh, uh, nectar flow coming on. But you got to understand, there's a, always a rapid turnover. If you have a 30-day, 35-day expected longevity, that means roughly every month you're completely aging out your bees and they're being replaced. That takes a lot of protein to do that, to replace all those bodies. About a pound to two pounds of incoming pollen per, um, per week, every week. Okay. Now, as they're expanding, they may not have any reserve at all. They may have that much bee bread in the afternoon, but by morning it may be all gone. But they're not hungry, they're getting just enough. They're living hand to mouth. And then it rains. Dr. Carl Krellsheim showed that by putting lawn sprinklers on top of colonies and then observing the nurses, within 45 minutes of turning on the lawn sprinklers, the nurses start cutting back on the amount of jelly that they feed to the larvae. The nurses react instantly to the lack of incoming pollen. And when I uh, graphed out Lloyd's data, I thought, well, well, I should smooth out this curve right here and this curve right here. And I realized, no, why would I do that? Why would I? Let me, let's find out why they had those curves there. So I went back to the weather history, 1976 weather history, Manitoba, Canada, and oh, a cold rainstorm moved in that day. And the bees cannibalized brood, shut down brood rearing, less brood. Okay? That's normal. Here I am in with a, uh, a mid-spring surprise snowfall, which we get up in our area. And at this snowfall, we had um, pretty much every other beekeeper in my county, all their colonies starved because they were right at the spring turnover. That's the worst time to have a, a snow event because their colonies are typically living hand to mouth. So we got out, as we do, we work in the snow and the rain all the time because that's bee husbandry, okay? If you're a beekeeper, your ethical responsibility is to feed your livestock if they are starving. So we don't sit inside watching TV saying it's cold and miserable outside. We put on our gear and get out there and we take care of our beehives. And our hives did okay. After four days, an unfed colony looked like this. They'd eaten all their honey, eaten all their bee bread, and cannibalized most of their brood. So these colonies, the ones that survived, did not make any honey that year. The ones we intervened a little bit earlier to keep them from cannibalizing the brood, they made a, a honey crop. The other thing we're noticing with climate change is that yards where we have successfully put out nukes every year for the last 40 years and expect a nectar and pollen flow, it's not happening some years. So now we're, and we go out and we have dead starvation. On warm days, no rain, but the nukes are building up quickly and they can't bring enough pollen and nectar in for their buildup and they starve right there. Now the colony didn't die, it's still alive inside, but a portion of the workers die off. And that saves the colony. If you eliminate those mouths to feed, okay, then the, the remaining ones can survive. So we're having to now put an extra coma honey into our nukes that we never had to do uh, before. Starvation is generally avoidable, okay? So, um, yeah. So, in answer to your question, we get out and we give them protein right away. So here's a picture of me treating my livestock better than I treat my own children. Because when it's miserable and raining, I say, boys, they grew up, you put on the gear, and we work out in the rain every day. We have, where I live, we can have rain for 30 days in a row, and we work bees 30 days in a row in wet, cold weather, keeping our colonies properly fed. Okay? So this is pollen sub. So we're feeding about a kilo at a time. And then we'll feed them also. When it's raining, there's no water foragers. So the colonies get desperately thirsty. And the nurse bees cannot produce jelly. So you got to give them moisture too. So we feed them a light sugar syrup to give them enough moisture that they can produce jelly. So pollen sub and moisture when it's raining in the springtime. Does that answer your question? Okay. Hive inspection. Okay. This would be a 10 second hive inspection for me. You pull this frame out of the middle of the brood nest of the upper box. They got adequate honey. They got bee bread. They got good larvae survival. Boom, back in, lid back on. Done. Okay. Before the bees, maybe one puff of smoke. <laughs> I'm in, out, and it's closed up. Okay. That would be a professional hive inspection. That's all you need. So healthy brood means you have good larval survival here. Spotty brood means one of two things. You either have dying larvae or starving larvae that are uh, diseased, or you have cannibalism by the uh, nurses, which I'll cover later. So what you look at is your larval progression. 
The queen typically starts laying eggs in the center of a comb and then spirals around. So you have a step down of larval age from the center of the comb down, an even step down. You have five instars, five different larval stages. So here again, nice step down. So these are uh, uh, fifth or fourth instar larvae stepping down, third, second, uh, the first instar. Now look at this one. You can see that there's larvae of all different ages side by side. That means those larvae are being either dying or being cannibalized, and the queen's coming back and laying another egg. This is an irregular brood pattern. This means slow down now. This inspection, now you've got to figure out what is happening here. And if you look carefully, you would see it's signs of European fowl brood in this colony. So look for whether you have an even larval progression or an uneven larval progression. One of the uh, pathogens is a fungus called chalk brood. Uh, when the larvae gets slightly chilled, there's more oxygen in the hemolymph of those larvae, and that allows this fungus to grow. The bees respond to chalk brood by creating an artificial fever. The warmer water is, the less oxygen it holds, so you drop the oxygen content of the water, and now this fungus cannot grow. So that's the natural response to chalk brood, making an artificial fever within the colony. No other cure. Um, if we have, now chocolate comes in waves. You get a new variant, you're going to see it uh, through your colonies for a year or two, and then the bees build up a transgenerational immune inheritance to it, and it disappears for a while, independent of anything you do. So if, it, if a colony cannot clear it itself, just requeen that colony. European fowl brood uh, really slows colony down, and again, this has variants that, are, that go through, and for a couple of years, you see a lot of European fowl brood, then the bees recognize that, build up their immune system to it, and it tends to go away. Unfortunately, your veterinary services are, to me, in my opinion, too restrictive. Spot treating with, with oxytetracycline is really good. You can clear out the few colonies that have it and end the infection. We, I, we don't ever prophylactically treat, but we do spot treat, and just like you would with your children or your other livestock, I don't know why they don't let you do that with your, your honeybee colonies. Okay, if we, you and I went to a buffet, and you walk out with a, a plate that is all one color of food, and I walk out with a plate that is a rainbow of colors, who likely has the most, more nutritious plate of food? Okay, same when you look here. If the pollen is all one color, you may have a plant that is deficient in one or two essential amino acids, and that pollen is junks. For example, dandelion pollen. If you have put bees on a diet of straight dandelion pollen, that colony will dwindle and die. They cannot survive on dandelion pollen. It's missing two essential amino acids. Okay. Here, uh, what we get, we get these uh, this fluorescent uh, rust fungus from the blackberries, and the fungus tricks the bees by putting out a sugary um, solution with it. To bring it back, the bees think it's pollen, and they store it in a big band of bee bread in, in, in September and October. And look at the brood. It's all dying. Okay? This took us a while to figure out why our colonies are having problems in the fall. If we take a pollen sub, Patty, and put it on there, within two days, they got fresh larvae with jelly, and they recover then. So that was a huge trick that we learned, is pay attention. Don't assume that bee bread is nutritious. Next huge trick, <laughs> tip I'm going to give you. Pay attention to the amount of jelly that the nurse bees feed to the second instar larvae. Not the first instar larvae, where they cover half the bottom of the cell with jelly, but the second instar larvae. See this? Here's the first instar larvae. Here's the second instar larvae. Bottom of the cell is completely covered. If the nurses are short on nutrition, they will restrict the amount of jelly they feed the larvae. They'll feed it just to stay alive, but there's no excess. That's what you can look for as a beekeeper. That tells you the nutritional status of that colony by how much jelly they put around the second instar larvae. So these are abundant uh, uh, food. These larvae are being fed just enough to stay alive. But when they turn into adult bees, they will not live up to the potential they will start foraging at an earlier age and live less time than the bee that was fed abundantly. Okay? So swimming in jelly, this is good. So when we go out to a, uh, an apiary, we have 60 apiaries. First person, when we stop, first person jumps out of the truck, starts to smoke, and runs to a hive, cracks the lid, pulls the frame out, and we're all waiting. They say, oh, it's looking wet, or it's looking dry. If it's looking dry, man, we out, we break open the pollen stub, we give them the protein, okay? Looking wet, everything's good, move on to the next apiary being fed just enough to keep alive, okay? Learn to look at the jelly. That monitors, tells you 
what the nutritional status of that colony is. Now we finally get to the swarming impulse. So up here, notice that the amount of, of immatures tops out, stabilizes. Okay, the colony starts to um, reach an equilibrium. Um, and at this point now, we now have way more adult bees than we have immatures. Okay, that's the cue to the colony, it's time to reproduce. Okay, so this difference in proportion here. And then you start backfilling with nectar, and the queen runs out of room to lay eggs. Four days later, every bee in the hive says, we don't smell any E-beta-osamine. There's no young larval pheromone. But we smell queen pheromone. That means either the queen is failing, and we have to start supersedure cells immediately, or we've run out of room, it's time for us to swarm. You never want to let the queen run out of cells to lay eggs in. You can reverse swarming by simply putting in empty comb, as Mike did, for her to lay in. So there's a continual odor of E-beta-osamine within the hive. And then this is the response. They rear drones. They rear queen cells. So here's your dilemma as any beekeeper. You want to build up your colonies to reach maximum strength at the beginning of the main honey flow without them swarming. So you can manipulate the brood nest. Or you can add combs. I got a whole other PowerPoint just on, on a swarm control. OK, now if you get to this point where you see the, now this is for a double deep, which we run. And on the bottom of the uh, frames of her box, now you would see this if you have a single on the bottom of the cell frames of your lower box. You see queen cells hanging down. It's too late to do manipulation. Now it's time to split the colony to avoid colony reproduction. Now. There are unwanted consequences of swarming. For the first thing, you're going to have a reduced honey crop. The second thing is nuisance to neighbors, like Andy was saying. His neighbors don't want swarms up there on the island. And if that swarm finds a cavity and establishes, now you have a competitor for resources out there. You've created a competitor. And when a swarm leaves, at that time, you have about 80% of the mites, varroa, are in the sealed brood, not on the adult bees. Half the adult bees leave, Taking, who can do the math? What's half of 80 of the, what's 100 minus 80 divided by 2? That's 10%. They only take 10% of the mites with them. Okay, most of the mites remain in the beehive, which means now you have a smaller colony awash with mites, so your parent colony is going to have more problems. The swarm has reduced their mite level, and they have a better chance of surviving for a while. So it doesn't help you with mite control at all, having your colony swarm. And if those colonies do establish out there, if they're non-resistant stock, you've just created a varroa factory in the neighborhood, and it's going to have mite immigration coming in from them, either from robbing or drift, later in the season. So allowing your colony to swarm creates problems for everybody. Be responsible to your neighboring beekeepers. Do never let a colony swarm. Now, how does a colony recover from that swarming? Well, if you look at a frame of sealed brood, or cat brood, one adult worker covers three cells, which means it's a three to one expansion. One solid frame of sealed brood emerges to three frames covered with workers. That's why the colony can quickly recover its population and why if you get a nuke with three frames of, of sealed brood, it explodes very, very quickly. So we're killing three birds with one stone. After almond pollination, we split all of our, our colonies. So one that eliminates swarming, Two, it requeens our colonies, the fresh queens. And three, we dribble them with an induced brood break um, from putting in a swarm cell with oxalic acid and control varroa for the first half of the year. Bang, three, three birds and one stone. We make nukes at the rate of about one a minute. Okay, so we have it down. We, we, we know how to, how to do that. Now we get to the main honey flow. Colony population peaks out. That's your goal. The stronger the colony, the more honey they will make proportionally per bee. So at that point, we combine any weaker colonies to have nothing but left but strong colonies. So we make an abundance of nukes and splits and new queens early in the season, and then we just combine them if necessary. We don't even look for the queens. We just put them together. I don't care if there's two queens in the hive or, or not. Just be free to do that. Understand the freedom you guys have. Forget all the rules about beekeeping. Produce a whole, raise your own queens, produce a whole bunch of splits in the springtime, avoid swarming, and then recombine. This solves the marriage problem, too. The marriage problem is when the spouse says, 
I thought this was going to be a hobby. We've got 47 hives in the backyard, and you're talking about splitting them all in half again? Because they don't recombine. Okay, Split avoids swarming, and then recombine, and you never have to grow to more colonies. Okay. Okay, then the honey flow begins. We call this shake. Do you call it shake here in, in England? We say, are you calling this shaking? Oh, I saw shake today. Okay, shake is when you sh shake the colony and nectar com comes out. Okay, yeah, in our climate in California, all nectar is ripened into honey overnight. So this is at 1030 in the morning from the blackberry float. So that's how much nectar coming in in just a few hours early in the morning. Then our drought started. And it gets down, that was like three or four drops we would see from the same yard, the same stage of bloom for years. We went from blackberry being our main honey crop to being non-existent for a number of years. Amazing what a drought will do. Okay, nectar now. So now at your interface, your energy interface, this is going to be fresh nectar rather than honey, and the brood nest will be forced downward. Now, at this point, the colony as a whole has to weigh this. Should we continue to rear brood? Will any egg raised to a worker at the beginning of the honey flow be of benefit to us? Well, it's three weeks before they're going to emerge, another two to three weeks before they'll be a forager, which means no, they're going to just be another hungry mouth to feed. They will not help us at all rearing larvae during a relatively short honey flow. With an extended one, yes. When they run out of, of um, empty cells to store nectar in, that tells the nurse, the mid-aged bees, time to produce wax. And they, you see what's called white wax. Do you call it white wax here? OK, so if you see white wax, that tells you two things. You're out of room, for one, and the colony needs room. They're out of space. You see white wax. So that means either you can do one of two things. They're either going to either put on more comb so they don't swarm, or you give them a foundation. There's no magic to drawing foundation. There's no potion you can add to the hive. There's no dance you can do. They will not touch foundation unless they're producing white wax. Once they're producing white wax, they will draw foundation very, very rapidly. Now, there's a feedback loops. The returning foragers secrete an enzyme called ethyl oleate. That suppresses the mid-aged bees from transitioning to foraging behavior. When the worker force, forager force starts to drop off, there's less ethyl oleate, and the mid-aged bees then start transitioning to foraging. So there's these feedback loops to maintain a ratio of about one mid-aged bee to every forager. The forager forages, the mid-aged bees take the nectar and then process it, build comb. So you need honey handlers and honey foragers. And then brood rearing is deprioritized. Lloyd's data shows, look at the amount of brood. There's no reason for them to rear more hungry mouths to feed, so the, the bees fill all the uh, brood cells full of nectar so the queen cannot lay. Okay? That's a benefit to the colony. Okay? They don't want hungry mouths to feed after the nectar flow. Now, what we do as beekeepers, we now trick the colony. They will swarm if they feel that they fill their cavity. So we enlarge the size of the cavity. And in areas of good honey flows, you can make a lot. Just for your information, those of you who have read the media rather than actually experienced it, at the time of everybody complaining about neonics and pesticides and GMOs and all that, I looked on the map, USG Geological Survey, and I found where on earth is the highest rate of pesticide application and the highest neonicotinoid application and the highest amount of genetically modified corn and soybeans growing. And I went there to do some ground truthing. That was in the state of Indiana. Here's Tim Ives here. Now he's on a little private farm. But as far as you can go in any direction, I looked at it and, and Google Earthed it, it's nothing but genetically modified neonicotinoid treated corn and soybeans. He says, well, if they're causing a problem, I'd like more of that. He's making 350 to 400 pound honey crops off of nothing but genetically modified neonic treated corn and soy. He says, this is the best beekeeping has ever been. That made me realize, wow, don't believe everything you read in the newspapers. And I heard that from every beekeeper in that area. It's the best it's ever been for beekeepers. And I'm not saying that the neonics are good. They are pesticides. They're insecticides. They cause all kinds of problems. But the end result is what you're looking at. I had beekeepers from, I didn't put in here, from Canada, where there's nothing but neonic treated, genetically engineered canola, as far as you can see. And they have yards that make this look tiny. Just 
every single hive stacked this high, 400 pound honey crops, and they're going, give me more <laughs> of, of that, okay? You guys, I, I read The Guardian, and I see the headlines. <laughs> oh my God, are you guys sure with a bunch of nonsense over here? It's, it's not, <laughs> BKB is not as disastrous. Almond polish is good for the bees. The, the neonic and, uh, and, and uh, genetic engineered corn and soybean have been a benefit to the bees, okay? We have far fewer problems than we had in the 60s and 70s. It's not perfect. There's way too much pesticide use, but we're making progress. It's getting better than it was. Okay, late summer, uh, no more pollen coming in. Colonies go into survival mode. Attrition exceeds recruitment, downhill. Eliminate any extra mouths to feed. Now at this point, you see, you have fresh honey right here, a little bit of trickle, trickle of fresh nectar, but no excess of pollen, no bee bread at all. If you look in these cells, you can't see it here, there's an egg in every cell, but you won't see one single in your larva because the nurses are cannibalizing them because there's no incoming pollen. So they just recycle that protein. They haven't quite given the queen the message yet, stop laying eggs because we're just going to eat them. <laughs> but that's what happens. So this August, this would be typical in my area. If I had Russian bees, you wouldn't even see any eggs. It would look like a totally broodless colony because they go into winter mode in August. Okay, that's 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 37 degrees centigrade. And, but there's no incoming pollen, so they go into that diutinous survival mode. And now our other thing. So, so far I've been talking to the, you guys who are better at being beekeepers. Now let me address you guys who are better at being varroa keepers, okay? Um, learn to use my varroa model. Uh, it's online. You can plan your uh, treatment schedule. What happens is, here's your adult bee population. Here's your amount of sealed brood in the hive. The red area down here is the proportion of sealed brood that's infested by a mite. Once you get over about 25% infested by a mite, the colony is toast. This is your varroa population. It doesn't explode. It just exponentially slowly increases here. But your mite wash count does explode because you have mites going up, but the number of adult bees going down. So the mite wash count is misleading in the springtime because most of the mites are in the brood and you have a lot of adults out there. So your treatment threshold is very, very low. You're talking about we treat if we see two mites in a mite wash count in the early springtime. Come um, the end of the uh, honey flow here, we'll go up to maybe five to six mites in a mite wash count. Uh, that'll be a treatment threshold. So a uh, proactive beekeeper does this. They treat early in the spring, get their mite count down, keep it down, hit them again right after the honey flow, hit them uh, then late in the season. This is not quite sustainable because we started with 100 mites. We ended with 223, so you would need one more oxalic dribble or vaporization uh, in the early winter there to be sustainable. So when you use the model, you want your ending mite count to be roughly the same. Now, if you're gonna split all your colonies, that would work, because now you'd split that 200 in half and you'd start with 100, okay? Okay, fall comes. If you get a, po a fall pollen flow, the bees will often store it below the brood, putting in a protein reserve that they will have come late winter when they need that protein uh, for maintenance and maybe brood rearing during the uh, winter. And now, what you see right here, um, these are the, 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 the workers that are emerging right here. These are going to form your winter uh, cluster. The, this is your survivorship from 100% to zero. And this shows that the bees that emerge in summer live a very short time, about 35 days. Th those that uh, emerge in the fall, they have a long survivorship until they start rearing brood and bingo, their survivorship drops back off again. So what we do is we first control the mites in, in August, mid-August, we want to have all our mite counts down. Only after you control the mites, then you want to initiate brood rearing. No sense rearing brood when you have mites because you're just rearing more mites. So eliminate the mites. And now when you have virus-free bees, now you rear your winter bees to go into the uh, winter. If they don't consume the pollen sub, just walk away from them. They're not worth your time. They got some kind of problem. We feed pollen, sub, and syrup if necessary. Now, ideally, feeding pollen, sub, and syrup is expensive. We avoid it as much as possible. We only feed it if it is necessary. Now, the, our goal, though, is to winter a large cluster for almond pollination. Your goal may not be that. If you don't have almond pollination, you don't want a large colony in February because you're just dealing with swarming. 
So you would not feed pollen sub and syrup in the fall. You would leave them just to uh, contract their cluster and winter as a small, tight cluster and do just fine. So I would look for experienced beekeepers, ask today, hey, what kind of survival rate do you get in your colonies? Okay, do you feed or not? Find out what actually works, okay? So um, your local experienced beekeepers, such as Roger, you know, those are a huge resource to find out what actually works for your environment. And then first frost knocks everything out and no more brood wearing right here. Emerging workers now come out and they go, hmm, sniffing around. Oh, I smell a queen. Hmm, I don't smell any fresh pollen. I don't smell any young larva pheromone. We must be in survival mode, right? We're not in build-up mode, which means we better find any reserves of bee bread left in the hive, tank up on it, and build up our fat bodies, our hypopharyngeal glands, and hunker down as survivor bees to wait it out until there's more pollen coming in. So they fill their fat bodies, then fat bodies are largely protein uh, reserves right there. And that's what lets them get through that long, that long dearth period. And you finally have the fall turnover then, when any bees that were foragers, they die off, and you wind up with about half your population then going into winter. Okay, I imagine most of you probably saw my, my winter cluster, uh, uh, so we can skip through that. That the center of that cluster is a tropical environment right here, where they control the, temp the temperature and the humidity in there. Um, now, I just bought this book yesterday about hive ventilation. You're going to get differing opinions on hive ventilation. It says, in the matter of ventilation, bees seem to make a very determined and high successful stand against imposed conditions imposed by the beekeeper. They refuse point blank to have anything to do with human notions of ventilation hygiene. Many devices have been tried in the form of vent shafts and the like to carry off the vitiated air of the hive. Never heard that word before. But all have failed because the bees insist on stopping up every crack or crevice left in the walls, roof, or floor. For some unscrutable reason, inscrutable reason, they will have only one opening which must serve for all purposes, and the hive maker has had to learn by hard-won experience that the bees are right. Well, that was 100 years ago. We still have hive makers recommending two openings in a hive, okay? I would listen to the bees. I would provide top insulation on top of the hives, a reduced single opening. Now, that single opening can be anywhere in the hive, but only a single opening, not two openings. Otherwise, you get thermosiphoning. Now we go into the winter, minimal attrition, until we get to the next uh, pollen flow. Now, the bees may initiate midwinter brood rearing, and Lloyd found a lot of that. Jeffrey's found a lot of that. And the question is why that is. They don't have much protein in there. Mobus and, and um, uh, Onhot suggest that it's to rid their bodies of excess moisture, their guts, by turning it into jelly and feeding it to larvae. That also seems to benefit the colony by that, round, uh, that brood reared during the winter. So, um, I covered that more in the wintering one, but I, I, that's to me is a fascinating subject that really needs some research, and, I, and it's so practical applied research, and I haven't found anybody interested in following up on that. Okay, so you can stimulate win, uh, late winter brood rearing. Those of us in California, in the anticipation of almonds, we use this a lot, and you can stimulate colonies even when it's cold outside to rear brood. First pollen starts coming in, we've repeated the cycle again, first all the pollen coming in, and we've completed one year. Um, oh, when you, you said about putting um, two colonies together, when you've made a split, um, you've got two queens in the hive. Well, if you do that, or in my experience of doing that, you get one queen that's manked up, or they can both get killed, and you get queen cells. Um, why not take one queen away, which you could sell or use in another nuke? And um, I've had hives where you get two queens going in the hive, and then you get them, they'll swarm. So how do you get around that problem? We don't, we don't see that problem. So I don't know if it's our stock or what. If there's um, any kind of nectar flow on, we don't see uh, two, the, both queens dying. Um, and we don't see swarming either. So I don't know why um, your stock does that. Yeah, no. We don't see it. We, we, we do it you know, thousands of times. We don't see it. So I don't know why. Sorry. The, the other question I had was, um, you said about um, neonic and 
But what? You said about neonicotinoids. Yeah. Nicotinoids. Um, what I've experienced with my um, beekeeping is um, quite a lot of deaths of queens, and um, they're unexplained deaths, not for what I'd put down as anything you could explain other than pesticides. So um, those um, hives you showed on the screen, uh -huh. um, is that person that's got those hives, do they rear their own queens or are they buying them in from somewhere else that's free of pesticides? Because the queen is the longest living member of a hive. She's the most likely to be affected and mm -hmm. definitely is in my experience, but you say not. That's a very good question. So what I did in it, to answer that question, I interviewed queen producers in the Midwest in the middle of the neonicotinoid areas to see if they had those issues. They said they didn't. Um, one of the things is um, my, my own colonies are a control group because we live in essentially a pesticide-free area um, and we don't use any synthetic miticides in our hives. So my combs are extremely clean. I've also talk, spoken with beekeepers in France who live out in the dairy areas where there's no pesticide spray a, at all. And all of us see exactly the same issues that the people in the other areas say. We see an elevated rate of queen loss that has happened uh, since Avroa. I just spent some time talking to Dr. Dave Tarpey, who's been investigating queens for 10 years in the United States. And he just did a presentation of a summary of his 10 years of research of why we have elevated, apparently elevated queen problems. And his answer was, they can't figure out anything. They cannot do any correlation with the pesticides. Um, so that's a, a, a question. And again, I see that in my pesticide-free environment also, but it did start happening after Varroa. We also see uh, smaller retinues around the queen. So we have this question. So what I'm seeing is, I don't know that it's queen loss. What I say is failure to successfully supersede. There's always been a turnover of queens. And colonies, back in the day when I was younger, you put bees in a box, walk away for 10 years, you come back, there's still bees in a hive in that box. That's not the case in many cases now. And it wasn't that we had one queen in that box for 10 years. You know they're going to swarm every year. You know they're probably they're going to be superseding. So they were able to supersede their queen successfully. Now what we see is queens failing without supersedure and colonies going queenless. So I, I, it's not so much the failure of the queens, it's the failure of a colony to supersede. So that's a mystery that we discuss at, at length, looking for correlations. And it's really easy to blame something, but we've been a lot of research looking to see if we can find a correlation between the purported culprit, like the neonics, and we just cannot find that. So if it were that easy, I would love to find the answer because then we can solve it, but we're not finding that. And there's been a lot of research looking hard at that very question. Thank you.